Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, What is Headship? from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. Well, this morning in 1 Corinthians, we're coming to a passage that has become a great battlefield of the 20th century. The 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, very complex chapter that deals with the question, are women fully human? (laughs) Or are they only humans, J.G., junior grade? This passage will deal with the question of male headship and female subjection and many other issues of today. Used to be the focus of this chapter was on the question, should women wear hats in church? But looking over this congregation, I can see that's a long past issue. And uh, it's now become the question not so much of women wearing hats in church, but whether they're going to wear the pants at home. But we're going to face some of these issues that have now become a part of the swirl of controversy that has escalated to the feminist movements of our day, and uh, one that is a very strategic and and decisive passage. So please follow as carefully and as prayerfully as you can. In the aftermath of the murders of the San Francisco mayor and the councilman up there, I'm I'm a little nervous about attempting this, but here goes anyway. The apostle introduces this with these words in 11 verse 2. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. Not all traditions are bad. We've seen in this letter that Christianity includes not only the revelation of what Paul calls the mysteries of God, those great, marvelous, insightful unfoldings of truth about humanity and about life that uh, are undiscoverable by the natural mind. No secular agency can help us here at all. But it also includes, as this passage makes clear, certain important and essential traditions, that is, practices that have been handed down from generation to generation. Now, in this chapter 2, there are two traditions the apostle looks at. The tradition of male headship, which dates from the creation of of mankind itself, from the earliest dawn of human history. And uh, the second one is the tradition of the Lord's Supper, dating from the beginning of the church as it was instituted in the upper room. Now, we're only going to attempt the first one this morning, and it's a uh, such a full passage that I may run a bit over time. I hope you'll stay with us because this is a very strategic passage. In verse 3, the apostle declares the great tradition of headship as a principle to govern the people of God for all time. And then in the following verses, verse 4 on through 16, he clarifies the practice of this principle under the conditions that were obtaining in Corinth and the world of the first century. Here is the principle. I want you to understand, he says, that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now, when the apostle uses the word head here, he's using the ordinary word for the hairy knob that sits on top the neck, that contains the brain and the eyes and the ears, the nose and the mouth and which even in the ancient world was understood to be the control center of the body. 
Now, there are some who would argue that today and say that the ancients didn't understand that. But I think it's obvious that they did because uh, all four of our five senses are centered in the head. And they well knew that to remove the head from the body ended everything about that body. <laughs> uh, thus the uh, Herodias, the wife of uh, Herod, the, uh, uh, ordered the head of John the Baptist brought to her on a platter because she knew that would uh, slow down John to a point where <laughs> she could handle it. Now when the head is used metaphorically, figuratively, as it is here, it refers to priority and function. That's what the head of our body does. It runs the body. It is in charge. It is the direction setter of the body. And therefore, used metaphorically, the word head means leadership primarily. And thus, it is used in this passage. Now, this is clear, I think, from the, from the, uh, threefold example that the apostle gives us here. The one in controversy is the second one. The head of the woman is the husband. But he brackets this with two other examples of headship that we might understand from that what the middle one means. Now, the first one is the head of every man is Christ. And there's a declaration of Christ's right to lead the whole human race. He is the leader of the race in the mind and thinking of God. And ultimately, as Scripture tells us, there will come the day when all humanity, without exception, every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, whether men know it or not, Christ is their head and they are responsible to follow him. That is the whole objective of life for any man to fulfill his manhood. This is what this passage means. Now, that's only seen in practice in the believer and only uh, to a limited degree there. But uh, it is stated very positively here. In the book of Hebrews, it says that he, Christ, is the pioneer of our salvation, the one who goes before, the one who opens the way. And this is the figure that is uh, caught up here in this uh, metaphorical use of the word head. He's the leader of the race, the determiner of every man's destiny, the one to be followed. Now skip down to the third level of headship, mentioned here, the head of Christ is God. Here we have a manifestation of headship already demonstrated for us in history. Jesus, the Son of God, equal with the, to the Father in his deity, nevertheless, when he assumes humanity, uh, commits himself to the leadership of the Father. And everywhere Jesus went, he said this, I do always those things which please my Father. Uh, he spoke of, uh, uh, on one occasion he said, My meat is to do my Father's will. I do that which, I, uh, uh, I do always those things which please him who sent me, he said. On another occasion, he says, I and my father are one. We work together. But he adds, on another occasion, my father is greater than I. Not as a challenge to the equality of the members of the Godhead, but when Christ became man, he voluntarily submitted himself to take a lower position than the father. And in that sense, he says, my father is greater than I. Now, those two headships help us to understand the meaning of the central one here. The head of the woman is the man. And by which I think it's clear the apostle means her husband. 
See, this is a passage that deals with marriage. It's not dealing with the relationship between man and woman in general. It's dealing with marriage, and particularly that role of support which the woman undertakes voluntarily when she marries a man. Uh, he is to be leader, and she undertakes a support role to help him fulfill the objectives of life as God, as Christ, his head, opens unto, unto him. And she is to support him in this. Now, if she doesn't want to do that, she's perfectly free not to undertake that role. No woman has to get married if she doesn't want to. This is a role that uh, she's perfectly free to forego if she chooses. If she wants to give herself totally to the pursuit of a career for her own objectives and so on, she has every right to do so. But then she ought not to get married because marriage means that she is undertaking to commit herself to help advance the objectives and goal and work of her husband. And he becomes, therefore, the leader of the two. Now, that's the principle of headship. And the apostle has stated it as clearly and as objectively as it can be stated. It does not involve the idea so much of origin as it does direction. And uh, this is the way it's used in other parts of the scripture as well. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body, by which he means he's its leader and uh, has the right to set ultimate direction of the relationship. Now in verses 4 on, the apostle is applying this principle to the practice of uh, the church, especially as it lived within the Eastern culture uh, of that first century world. And so he says in verse 4, any man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled dishonors her head. It is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, then let her wear a veil. Now, two things are very important to notice in that paragraph. One, the center of... Uh, the, of his concern is the public ministry of the Word of God. He's talking here about Christians. He's talking about church, the gathering of believers together in a public assembly. And in order to properly function, he says, in that capacity, a woman should wear a veil, a man should not. And the veil comes in then as the symbol of the acceptance and understanding of this principle of headship, which he's just been talking about. Now, where public ministry is involved, it's just as important that man should not be covered as that a woman should. This is what he's saying. In the culture and custom of that day and time, and it's significant to note that both men and women properly were free to exercise a ministry. Both of them could pray and prophesy. And as we've understood from other passages of Scripture, and we'll come to more clearly in the 14th chapter, prophesying is what we call preaching today. It is expounding the Word of God, taking the Scriptures and making it shine, illuminate life. Now, a woman or a man could do that. But it was very important how they did it. This is the emphasis the, this passage makes. 
uh, they had to do it in two different ways. The man as a man, the woman as a woman. And that's the emphasis of this text more than anything else. If the man does not do it as a man should in that culture, then he dishonors his head. Now, it's very remarkable that Paul would say here that a man uh, ministering in public should have something, should not have anything on his head because, as you well know, the practice among the Jews is always for men to have something on their head when they minister. You can see Jewish people walk, uh, walking around. The men will often have the little uh, yarmulke, it's called, or a beanie, we would call it, <laughs> on their head. It's a covering for the head. And no Orthodox male Jew would ever think of reading the Scripture or ministering in public without that. Yet Paul says, the apostle raised in Judaism says that if that, if a Christian does that, he's dishonoring Christ, his head. On the other hand, if a woman does not have a covering in this uh, first century Christian setting, she dishonors her head, her husband, who is her head. Now, the reason for that, of course, was even more dramatic in Corinth, because in this city, the most licentious city of the first century, the only women who did not wear a veil in that, cust in that culture were the temple prostitutes. And any woman, therefore, appearing on the public streets without a veil was opening herself up to the suspicion that she was available to any man who wanted to pay the price and that she was nothing more than a temple prostitute. Therefore, it was indeed disgraceful, shameful for a woman to appear in public and especially in the ministry of the word in the Christian assembly without that sign of, of uh, acknowledgement of the principle of headship in her life. Uh, Notice that Paul says, if it is disgraceful for a woman uh, to, to be, uh, uh, how does he put it? For a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her wear a veil. Notice the if. You see, in some cultures, it would not be disgraceful. It isn't today. It's not disgraceful that a woman doesn't wear a hat in church. She isn't subjected to abuse or suspicion of what of her moral character. It's only where it is disgraceful, where that is the interpretation put upon it, that this applies. But if it is not, then it's another matter. Where it does apply like that, as it did in Corinth, then Paul's saying, if she doesn't want to wear the sign of submission or of, of uh, relationship under headship, well, then she ought to go the whole way and act like a, a prostitute because that's what she is uh, uh, declaring herself to be by her refusal to wear this veil and submit to custom. But where it's not disgraceful, that's another matter. Now, immediately, the apostle follows this with an explanation. And here we come to the very heart of the passage. He tells us why this is true. Verse 7, For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is a very crucial paragraph and one we want to take carefully and understand fully. You'll notice the apostle does not base his reasons on any local custom. He goes back to creation to establish this. This is something true from the beginning of mankind. He does just as Jesus does on the subject of divorce. He doesn't bother with all the interpretations and uh, 
adumbrations that came in by the law of Moses, but he goes back to God's created order. And so does the apostle here. He says that in the beginning it was different. Man, he says, is made in the image and glory of God. Now, image is a manifestation of something uh, that uh, is being represented by that image. In this case, it is the it is God Himself. Man was made in God's image in order that creatures anywhere looking at a man would see the likeness, the nature of God. That's what God. This is the dignity of humanity. Man was made in the image of God, and he is the glory of God. We'll look at that in just a moment. But what I want us to bear clearly in mind is when that statement is made in the book of Genesis about the man, the creation of man, it was made at a time before they were separated into two sexes. Adam was created... And it was of Adam, before Eve was separated from him, that it is said that man is the image and the glory of God. Which means that after that separation, woman bears the image and the glory of God equally with the male. They're both involved when it is said that man was made in the image and the glory of God. That's why in Genesis 5, not Genesis 1 now, but Genesis 5, verse 1, it, it, it says that God created them in the beginning and made them male and female, and he named them Adam. He named them both in, in the one being, Adam. He didn't name them the Adamses. <laughs> but he named them Adam. And therefore the woman bears equally with the man the image and the glory of God. Now that's very important. And yet the male is called upon to manifest a certain aspect of the glory of God different from that of the woman. And that's what this passage now begins to develop. What is glory? Well, glory, as it's used here, is something in which we take delight. We've often sung the hymn, In the, Christ of, in the cross of Christ I glory. What do we mean by that? Well, the cross is something in which we find delight. It's that principle of life by which we see ourselves cut off from the old Adamic life, freed from the control of sin and death, set free to be the men and women God intended us to be. And understanding that, we sing quite properly, along with the Apostle Paul, in the cross of Christ I glory. Paul could write to the Thessalonians and say, Who is our crown of rejoicing? Are you not our glory? and our joy. So used this way, this is telling us that when man was created, he was made by God to reflect the nature of God, and in that God takes great delight. He made mankind and delights in mankind. And this is what the male is to represent. That image and glory of God is to be publicly and openly manifested, and that's why the man must not wear a veil. He's to be uncovered. He's to be out in the open so that the glory of God in his creation should be visibly manifest to everyone. You see this beautifully in the life of Jesus. Everywhere he went, he demonstrated the love of God for mankind. The fact that even though the race was, was, had turned aside and was far from what it ought to be, 
everywhere in the ministry of Jesus, you see oozing out, pouring forth the love of God for man. And that's what drew people by the by great multitudes to the words of Jesus. They caught a glimpse of the glory that and delight that God takes in humanity, in him. And they longed to find the way back to the enjoyment of that delight. That's why it says in opening words of John's gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And this is the glory that a man, a male, is called to manifest in the ministry of the word. He's not to be veiled because he is manifesting that public, open uh, delight that God takes in a created mankind, in the creation of mankind. But now woman is said to be the glory of the man. It's in the woman that the man finds delight. And if you don't believe that, you just watch a couple of teenagers in the spring. <laughs> or anybody who falls in love. The woman is the glory of the man. Now you see, he's dealing with the woman as having been separated from the man. The distinction which, uh, uh, which uh, obtained when God took Adam's rib and made of him a woman and brought her to man now comes into, into focus. And it indicates a kind of private, intimate glory. That uh, intimacy which a man finds in his wife, in the uh, intimacy of sexual relationship and of love and sharing and fellowship that grow together and therefore it is a uh, uh, it is to be symbolized by a veil it's something hidden something protected something guarded for a single individual's use thus the veil is not a mark of subjection as many even of the uh, commentators say about this passage a veil is a mark of intimacy of privacy, voluntarily assumed by the woman. She isn't made to do this. She deliberately chooses to do so. But from then on, she's marked out as belonging to another. Now, the nearest equivalent of that in our day is a wedding ring. A wedding ring marks a woman as belonging, already claimed, already uh, she has given herself freely and voluntarily to a man, and she is his property in this, in a, uh, not in a uh, mechanical sense, but she has already surrendered her, the right to herself to him. Now that's always the meaning of the veil in the Eastern world. It still is today. A woman walks down the street of an eastern city, an oriental city, veiled today. She's telling the whole world, I'm not on sale. I don't belong to anybody but my husband. I'm his. And in wearing a veil, a woman declares thus, she is giving testimony to another manifestation of the glory of God, an intimacy that is achieved only through redemption. That when we enter in by faith in Jesus Christ into a new birth, we discover an intimacy of God beyond creation. It is redemptive glory. We all know it if we're Christians. We all know the ecstasy of fellowship with God, of worship, of understanding that beautiful, intimate love relationship of the bride and the bridegroom that is so beautifully declared in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. And that's what a woman is declaring in her public ministry when she wears a veil. She is manifesting, symbolizing that intimate delight 
God has in a redeemed mankind. Now, I can't dwell on that, though I think that's very important. But thus the intent of creation is fulfilled. And this is why Paul goes on to point out that a woman has a unique relationship with a man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Woman was taken from man in order that she might share his nature fully. They are not two different kinds of beings. They don't represent two different species of human life. They are different, but they have the same basic nature. And this is symbolized by woman being taken from man. But in addition, she is brought to man because she was taken from him that she might be for him. And this, I think, is the key word involved in headship. She is for her husband. She's behind him. She's supportive of him. She wants him to succeed, and she's involved in the process. She's backing him up. She's undergirding him in every way she can and finding delight in doing so, that together they might achieve the objectives and the work which his head, Christ, has set before him. Now, that's God's ideal of marriage. He, in turn, the male, is to seek to discover the secrets God has put into his wife and to develop her so that she will be all that she's capable of being. Because in doing that, he's but advancing his own objectives. This is the argument of Ephesians 5. They're one, and no man hates his own flesh. And if he hurts his wife, he hurts himself. If he... If he ignores her, he's ignoring half of his own life. And there's no way that he can discover the fullness of his manhood in marriage apart from him working at at developing and discovering and encouraging his wife to fully discover and develop all that God has put in her. That's why you have that reciprocal relationship so frequently mentioned in Scripture in marriage. Now, this is the beauty, of course, of every wedding. When a man and a woman stand together to be married, the marriage ceremony has for centuries recognized this truth, that she is giving herself to him. And he promises to treat that gift with kindness and tenderness and love and care. But he's not giving himself to her She is giving herself to him. That's the point. And uh, he is responsible to cherish that gift as the most valuable gift that's ever been given to him. And thus to take care of it and protect it and guard it. And that's what's happening in a marriage. That's why basically the marriage is repeating those beautiful words in the book of Ruth. Where you go... I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. That's what's happening in marriage. Now, if you don't want that to happen, then don't get married, because that's what marriage is. If you're not willing to assume that role in marriage, then by all means, stay single. But when marriage occurs, that is what is meant. Now, that's why Paul goes on to add two more important words here from the argument of creation. Verse 10, that is why a woman ought to have a veil on her head because of the angels. What does he mean by that? Well, unfortunately, the translators have have obscured this by translating the word Paul uses as a veil. Here he changes the word. He doesn't say veil on her head. Literally, it's the word authority. That is why a woman ought to have authority on her head, because of the angels. Authority to do what? Well, what he's already mentioned. 
what the whole passage is about. A woman ministering in public. She's the, the authority for her to minister the word of God in public is her recognition that of the principle of headship and that she does so uh, having assumed with delight voluntarily the leadership of her husband. And thus she is to wear a veil which in that culture was the sign, the symbol of that kind of submission. And she's to do so, Paul says, because of the angels. Now that's a little diff difficult perhaps to interpret, but in a culture where unveiled women were regarded as idolaters and prostitutes, it would be an offense to the angels present in a Christian service that a woman would openly flaunt the custom to uh, deny the principle of headship. And the angels are ministering spirits, we're told, sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. And therefore, the woman is to be subject because the angels who were present at creation and understand this principle of headship might possibly be offended by it. I can't dwell on that anymore. But in the next two verses, Paul balances all this with a strong statement of the equality of men and women in marriage. Nevertheless, in the Lord, the woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of women, and all things are from God. And here is a very positive statement of the full equality as persons of men and women. There's no inferiority involved at all. Never was and never will be. When uh, marriage is seen as God intended it to be, in the Lord, Paul carefully declares that they cannot exist without each other. And they're equal as persons, distinct as sexes, functioning in a divinely given order which is freely accepted by the woman in order to demonstrate the delight of God in his creation and in the redemption of mankind. I think if we'll carefully think that through, that's a very powerful argument. Now let me quickly handle the problem of hair. Verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that for a man to wear long hair is degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her pride. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Now this is really a second argument the apostle gives about the matter of of uh, wearing a veil. And he takes it now from nature. Not only does creation, God's intent in creation, sustain the principle of headship, but nature will illustrate it. Now, many have struggled over this passage. I have myself for many, many years. What is there about nature that says a man with long hair dishonors his himself and his God, while a woman with long hair honors her God, her head. What is there about nature that says that? The answer, I think, is, uh, is the principle that we now scientifically have come to recognize is true. But it's been true from the very beginning of the race, as far as we can tell. And that is the factor of baldness. <laughs> you see, geneticists tell us that, that it takes two genes in a woman to produce baldness. Some women do get bald. But it's very rare because it takes two genes to produce baldness in a woman, but only one to produce baldness in a man. And therefore, here is a natural fa factor that has been functioning since the race has been on earth, that uh, 
does indeed display these very things that Paul's talking about. Did you ever see an old man bald with long hair? It's a disgrace. His hair is stringy and, uh, and uh, hanging around, blowing around, and his shiny dome sticking up above it <laughs> makes it look ridiculous. And it's true all through history. Almost all men, as they grow older, tend to have show some degree of baldness, and the older they grow, the more ridiculous long hair looks. Now, a young man can get away with long hair, but an older man can't. And there is a factor in nature that demonstrates it. But a woman is a different story. Many of you know that my wife's mother lives with us. She just turned 91 last August. And though, like anyone of that age, her skin has lost its texture, its tone, and its beauty, and so on. Wrinkles have come in, and, and all the signs of aging. Yet she has hair that she usually wears in a bun, which, when she lets it down, falls well below her waist. And it's a beautiful thing. It's her pride and glory. And at 91, her hair is as beautiful as it was when she was a young girl. In fact, it's not even gray yet at 91. And uh, she's not going to demonstrate this for you, but... Uh, <laughs> I wish you had opportunity to see it because her hair is beautiful. And this is exactly what the apostle is talking about here. Nature says that a woman bear, has, has been given the gift of longer hair than men in order that she might manifest the principle of headship. And you see, this was written after all this argument about wearing a veil in Corinth. Paul says her hair was given to her for a covering. And here's the beauty of the scriptures. It's not written just for Corinth or for the first century, but any age and every age. And this is what the apostle means. In a culture where it is not, where the wearing of veils is not a custom, then long hair, longer than her husband's, is an adequate expression of the principle of headship. And that's what he means. And so he co concludes the passage with these words in verse 16. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we recognize no other practice, nor do the churches of God. There's no need to argue the point, he says. The universal custom in the Roman world was for a woman to declare this principle of headship by wearing a veil. And there's no point in arguing about it, he said. It's such a universal custom that uh, anybody not doing this is immediately opening themselves to, to uh, disapprobation. But where it's not, then uh, uh, the woman's head covering, longer than her husband's, is adequate testimony to this principle. Now, what does this passage say to us? Let me just gather it up very quickly. It says, first of all, men, by all means, take your responsibility as spiritual leaders in a home. You have responsibility to your head to know the mind of Christ and to see that it becomes lovingly the, the format, the atmosphere, the climate of your home. That's your responsibility to do. Women, your responsibility is to follow your husband in these leads and support him and encouraging him. And if you're unwilling to do that, don't get married. But if you marry, support your husband's efforts toward a godly family and back him up where he, when he moves in these directions and let him know you're behind him and for him and supportive of him. And third, if women are called to minister the word in a public place, do so with humility, because that's the heart of this principle of headship, and with respect for the leadership of a church. 
That's what's involved in it. And that fulfills the mind and purpose of God. Now, you've been very patient, and I know this has gone over today, and I appreciate your patience, but you can see that it was necessary that we finish the whole passage and not leave it halfway there. Let's stand together now, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for the faithful teaching of your word. And we pray that we may fully remember that our views of life are often shallow and superficial and uh, inadequate. But whenever we conform to that divinely given order, we find ourselves opening for ourselves a door of joy and love and peace such as we never dreamed of. That your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And we pray that we may indeed discover this as men and women together we fulfill the demands of the headship given to us. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is her husband. In Jesus' name. See you.
Time and time again you call us to return 